All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> Yippee Kaye, motherfuckers. Welcome to the Actual Anarchy Podcast, episode 54. We're talking about the Christmas movie. Die Hard, starring Bruce Willis, Mr. Moonlighting himself. Before we get to that, I want to tell you a couple of things. Number one, we just had Black Friday and Cyber Monday, but I know a lot of us are procrastinators out there, so if you do have any shopping to do, do start with our Amazon links at actualanarchy.com. They're all over the place in the sidebar, uh, interspersed in some of the stories. If you click on some of the images in our show notes pages, you'll find some Amazon links. And you don't even need to buy the stuff that we have on display there. That's just a way in. And then you can use the little search bar and get anything else that your little heart desires or uh, that you think that any of your little gift receivers might desire. And other than that, uh, we just had a couple of really good episodes. We had Walter Block on talking about Poverty, Inc. And then the last show we had was Kyle Ancelone uh, talking about War Machine, the Brad Pitt movie about the blunders in Afghanistan. And I think that that one was really well done. He brought a level of expertise that was not forthcoming from either Robert or myself. So we really appreciated him joining us and lending some credibility and some expertise uh, to that episode. There's a lot going on in Afghanistan still to this day. Kind of a sad state of affairs, but uh, that's a really good episode, and that is episode 53, so actualanarchy.com slash 53. This one on Die Hard will be actualanarchy.com slash 54. And we do have a special guest, a returning guest. He joined us for Batman, The Dark Knight, and also The Dark Knight uh, Rises, I think. Yeah, that's the one where he has Bane, and he climbs out of the hole in the prison by believing in himself and not having a safety line. I think that was the whole message of that one, other than the communism, which seemed to be running rampant in uh, that third installment of the Nolan trilogy. And we also might have another special super guest in the pre-show and potentially in the Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which is available for our Patreon supporters. So you can get on in on that action at our Patreon page at patreon.com slash readrothbard, or you can access it via our tip jar page, which is actualanarchy.com slash tip jar. And that it will also show you a bunch of other ways you can support us. Then uh, Kathleen Turner Overdrive is where we continue the conversation just in a bit of a looser format. I know it's, it's hard to believe we can get looser than uh, in the show, but we can. And that is uh, uh, the after show stuff. So we're just kind of, you know, bullshitting and hanging out, kind of talking about, oh, you know, I wish I'd said this. I wish I'd said that. Or, uh, uh, you know, let's talk about anything else, anything else that comes up. What else do I want to let you guys know about while we're waiting for our guests to arrive? How about the Rothbard Repository, which is a database of 60, 60, Murray Rothbard lectures that are keyword searchable, and then you can open up the individual lectures that show up in your result, and then do a control F to find the term that you're searching for, and it'll give you the timestamp. Also, the video is embedded in those search pages. So if you are having a debate or just a, a keen interest in a certain topic that Murray Rothbard may have discussed in his lectures, you can find it very, very easily. And it's a, it's a really cool tool. That is available for our $10 a month or more supporters on Patreon. It's also available as a standalone purchase item. Uh, go to repository.readrothbard.com. You can find out about that. We also throw it in as a bonus for uh, people who buy Liberty Classroom from us at our affiliate link. So just click on Liberty Classroom in the sidebar on actualanarchy.com or on our tip jar page. And any level on the Tom Woods Liberty Classroom uh, will be eligible to receive the Rothbard repository. Also, we throw in a uh, read it for dot me membership. Uh, it's their light membership. But what that is, it's a summary of business books, personal development books, etc. It's a really neat way to get the gist or the main points of 
uh, you know, multi-hundred page books that uh, would take five or eight hours to read, but you can get these summaries and, and be done in 10 or 15 minutes. So it's really a time saver if you are really uh, a busy person, but you still want to keep growing and keep learning things. That is a, a really great tool. I do use it myself. Uh, in fact, all of the things that we offer on our website at actualanarchy.com tip slash tip jar are things that we do, in fact, use ourselves and we stand behind them. We believe in them. Uh, we're happy with them. And that's the only reason that we throw them out your way as well. Uh, also, you know, we get the, you know, one, one and a half, two percent commission on some of those smaller things like the Amazon stuff. I think it's a four percent unless you get uh, over a certain threshold per month, but we've never gotten to that point. Uh, another thing is we have the Libertarian Union, which is now up to nine providers, and that is at libertarianunion.com, or there's a Facebook page, Libertarian Union One, so facebook.com slash libertarianunion one, the number one, and you can find Foreign Policy Focus, the ANCAP Barbershop, uh, Liberty Weekly, the Battle for Liberty, Libertarianism for Normal People, uh, Wizardly Wisdom, uh, Don't Waste Your Hate, uh, and then our show, the Actual Anarchy Podcast, also uh, the Subversion Podcast, that's the newest one, and uh, that's really good. It blends music and anarchy uh, together. And, and, and by anarchy, we mean anarcho-capitalism, the only true anarchy that exists. That's why we have actual anarchy as the name of the site. And here's the Libertarian Union plug. In the early days of the internet, radical libertarians were scattered, lonely, and faceless. Without direction, they resigned to scour the web, sifting through content providers in a wasteland plagued by YouTube demonetization, Facebook jail, and covert internet censorship. But then, in 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com. How are you doing, Robert? Who am I talking to? Your mama. Oh, snap. How's it going, Mom? I haven't talked to you in a while. I should call you more often, but, you know, we live busy lives and it gets troublesome. You know, I'm a bad kid. Yeah, it's uh, pretty busy bad over kid. there uh, not having a job. <laughs> Um, actually, I do have a job, asshole, and you would know that if you ever listened to what I said. So go screw yourself. Oh, right, right, right. No, are you, um, you doing some, uh, the design work? Is that the deal? Design work? Oh, yeah, uh, I was supposed to do some stuff, but that hasn't happened yet because uh, Dude Bucket hasn't uh, given me some stuff yet. But other than that, I'm, yeah, I'm drawing every day. Not that people would care, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> no, man, the people care, the people care. They care so hard. They care hard. I know. They're a bunch of care hards. It's true. I know we were care hards way back in the day, both of us, you know, lefty, liberal, thinking that, uh, oh, we just need to help the little guy. Yeah, and now you've regressed back entirely to that. Unbelievable. I know. Now I'm uh, legitimately a care hard. I, I care so hard that I think that people should not be interfered with. <laughs> kind of outrageous. I know. Outrageous claim is that. Uh, it's pretty amazing when you look into all of these programs and you realize that not only are they funded via theft, but they pervert incentives. So it's, you know, it's just like Thomas Sowell talks about where whatever you pay for, you get more of. Uh, so you're essentially subsidizing. So anything that you're putting money into as far as a program to like change, alter behavior, you know, do the social engineering business, you end up getting more and more of that bad behavior. It's, it's crazy how that works. And on a cursory glance, it looks like, oh, we're, we're giving money to this, you know, downtrodden group of whoever. Uh, and that should lift them up or help them out. But it, it really just traps them. Yeah, it sure does, buddy. Especially since you put a, uh, like Dr. Black will mention, since you put, you know, strings attached and that sort of thing. It's not just, here, we're going to give you some extra money. It's here, give you some extra money. And if you ever, you know, get into a relationship with somebody who doesn't make as much money, then it's going to be more worthwhile for you to drop that guy and have the state be the father. And so right. you destroy the, destroy the poor families. Right, because you incentivize them to remain separated because they're going to make, quote unquote, make uh, more money by not having a, a family unit, you know, by being a single parent household, then they get more money. And so the, the man has to compete with that in general yeah. terms. Sure does. He's got to provide more value and then some to make it worthwhile. It's great. 
Killing them with kindness, baby. Destroy the family. And what's the family really ever done for anybody anyway? I mean, who cares? Well, you know, if you're a good socialist, uh, you want to destroy the family unit and make the state be the family unit. Well, we are a collective, aren't we? That pesky social we're all, contract. <laughs> we're all one. We're all one people. We're all one Borg. We're all the same human family. The hive mind. So what you so, got you, dude? Well, the saga continues. I have now finally finished moving things around in the office, and it was a good exercise in futility, which was nice, though I did get an opportunity to clean a lot of the uh, corners and crevices and cracks that haven't seen the light of day for a year and a half, two years. So there was a net positive. It's a little bit cleaner. Uh But also, I now have um, six storage ottomans in here, and things are now finally coming together. So I can store a lot of things that used to be like up on the desk into these ottomans, including camera gear, audio gear, computers, wires, and and junk like that. And now there's a clear division between the workout zone and the office slash studio zone. So that is actually working out really, really well. We got the high-speed internet out here. I've insulated the floor. So now uh, the floor is a lot softer. There's um, quarter-inch like padding underneath the carpet. So it's going to be warmer, more insulated, all that good business. It's really working out, man. All right. This is episode 54 of the Actual Anarchy podcast with our returning guest, Shaheen Mohammadi, And he had joined us for some previous episodes discussing the Nolan movies, Batman Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises. How you doing? Joining us all the way from Adelaide. Hey, how you doing, guys? Good to be back on. Yeah, we're happy to have you. You are a popular guest and a uh, a good guest and, I don't know, a Thanks. friend even. So I, I like right. you very much, and I, I know a I see you Robert. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> nah, just kidding. All good. Uh, and you also write for us on the site occasionally when you're in between your engineering studies and economic studies and political theory studies. So yeah, we're... Uh, I probably have a couple more um, articles coming in. I'll probably try to write a bit more when I'm on the trip because I'm going on a holiday in two days uh, for about uh, a month. So I'll probably write as much then and just send you a bulk of articles when I get back. All right, that sounds good for me. We'll drip feed those out a little bit to to spread the wealth, so to speak, (laughs) like the good commies we are. And uh, uh, so those will show up on actualanarchy.com. And you've already got like five or six articles up there uh, presently, so uh, we look forward to more of your stuff. And uh, uh, this episode is going to be about Die Hard. So yippee-ki-yay, motherfuckers. (laughs) Yeah, baby. Yeah, so... One of the greatest Christmas movies of all time. So Robert's throwing his his gauntlet down with the uh, black and gold on the opening move. A very strong move, Cotton. What will he do next? There's nowhere to go but down. Yeah, well, this is one of those movies that I hadn't seen in in probably a decade, decade and a half. And that was well before my conversion to uh, the ANCAP-ism. Well, well, what's that that it says, the the middle thing, it says, Die Hard isn't a Christmas film according to a new YouGov poll. That just stood out. Bullshit. Yeah, there's some debate it, it? as to whether it's a Christmas film or not. And apparently, According to what definition? I mean, come on. It's set in Christmas. It goes to a Christmas party. It's on, set on Christmas Eve. It's got what Christmas else, and Hollis. You want? <laughs> they, yeah, they even play Christmas time in Hollis, right? At the very beginning. I mean, it's, a Christmas movie is not allowed to be a bit masculine here and there. I mean, seriously. Yeah, it's a bit yeah, you got too, long-haired too German guys running around. Yeah, like uber, uber menches, uber Nazi dudes. Right? With long hair, flowing hair. Yeah, come on. It's like a Fabio uh, novella cover, like those uh, steamy romance novels that used to be in the grocery stores. I don't know if they still are. Yeah, right, you don't. I haven't looked lately. Last time I went to look, yeah, they weren't there. Yeah, last time I went looking for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Shaheen, you saw that on, our, on my screen share, which is something that we have available for our Patreon supporters. They get a behind-the-scenes look including video of our shows. They get before show, they get the show, they get the Kathleen Turner Overdrive, and they get the video, including my pretty face and your ugly mug uh, and, and Robert's um, uh, black screen of death when he, uh, when he speaks, because he's, he's on the copper wire, so no, no video for him. Uh, and if people wish to view these, uh, we have probably 30 or 40 of these up on the uh, Patreon now. Uh, go to patreon.com slash readrothbard, and you'll find all of that good stuff. Uh, and I just totally derailed what I was going to say. Oh, you saw this because I pulled up the Google description, which is how we open many of our shows to go through the Google description and laugh at how wrong it is. So if you guys are ready, I can get into that. Do it. All right, here we go. 
Die Hard, 1988 thriller action movie, 2 hours and 12 minutes, 8.2 on IMDb, 92% Rotten Tomatoes, and 88% of Google users like it. The description reads as, New York City policeman John McClane, played by Bruce Willis, is visiting his estranged wife and two daughters on Christmas Eve. He joins her at a holiday party in the headquarters of the Japanese-owned business she works for, but the festivities are interrupted by a group of terrorists who take over the exclusive high-rise and everyone in it. Very soon, McClane realizes that there's no one to save the hostages but him. Came out July 15, 1988, so summer blockbuster, director John McTiernan, and he uh, uh, he had done some um, movies just before this that were pretty... Big blockbusters. Do you guys remember? Might have to look that up. Uh, budget of 28 million, and it did very, very well at the box office. I think something over 140 million. Yeah, it did so well that it spawned a whole bunch of crappy sequels, movies that declined in quality over the years. The special effects look better, but the scripts get more hackneyed. Also, maybe Die Hard 3 was decent, but really they don't hold a candle to one. I mean, if you watch the rest of them, they just Bruce Willis just gets older and older and it's just more ridiculous and more ridiculous what, what he survives. And then they cram him in saying his catchphrases and really awkwardly and dumb. You know, it's just, there's no, it's, it's, it's the original or nothing, man. Die Hard series is not a, not a venerable franchise in my opinion. <laughs> well, good thing I bought the five pack on uh, the voodoo when it was on sale. I, 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 move back, like. Yeah, perhaps I'll get to watching the rest of them. Though, you know, I do find that we have so many, shows to do and so much content available that it's it's like an abundance, right? Like my cup runneth over with movies to watch. And so I don't know if I'll ever get to these. Um, but I did uh, look up McTiernan and he had done Predator with Schwarzenegger right before this. Ooh. And then he later on did uh, Hunt for Red October and then got into some of the follow-ups for Die Hard. So he's done some decent other quality work too. So he didn't just come out of nowhere doing Die Hard. Makes sense. Predators and also another great movie that has held up over time. The special effects, not so much, but the story is just solid. You got classic Arnold probably in one of his best roles. Which, I mean, they're, they're all pretty much the same. Get to the, the chopper. Yeah, you got, you got the classic Get to the chopper, which is classic. You got Stick It Around, which is one of the best. Um, and then you got Jean-Claude Van Damme, who was supposed to be in this goofy suit as the Predator. But... Anyway, good movie. Holds up. All right, well, let, let's dissect this uh, Google description a little bit because I think there were at least one or two errors in it. Um, did anyone notice them? I'll go to Shaheen. Didn't it say that he was to see his daughter even though he had twins? Yeah, they said two daughters. I thought he had a son. Yeah, he's got definitely got a son, doesn't he? Maybe not. Yeah, he, he, has, a son, he has a son and a daughter. Uh, the son is Lucy and the daughter is – or the daughter is Lucy and the son is, um, I want to say John Jr. maybe? They call him Jack, something like that. He's in some of the later – Die Hard movies, like the Russia one. He's like the main dude. Yeah, yeah, the, the most recent one, I want to say, is the Russian one, where they're both Die Hard and it up. Double Die Hard. It, it's, it's really not good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, by the time I watched it, I was totally spent on Die Hard. But, yeah, I don't know. It's just bad. Anyway, anyway, let's talk about this one. All right, yeah, let's talk about this one. So um, the first time I saw this was shortly after it came out, and I must have been – pretty young because this came out when I was like 10 years old and it was just a, a shoot 'em up blow 'em up movie but back at the time it came out I mean I knew Bruce Willis as an action star uh, due to this movie and, and there were of course many derivatives of it like so many movies came out right after this and it was described as die hard on a boat die hard on a train die hard uh, on a plate with green eggs and ham, you know, like every other action movie that came out after this was like a, uh, a rip off of Die Hard, like Under Siege and Speed, Speed. and uh, yeah, the, ro the Rock. The genre. Sure, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so it was, it was Die Hard on X or Y or Z, and I'm, I'm using Z for you, Shaheen. Uh, <laughs> really, and really, it's just an action thriller that kind of all set in one spot or has a certain specific gimmick to it. But yeah, that's pretty much how you do it. Yeah, and, and one person against, you know, all odds. Uh, outnumbered, overwhelmed, being, you know, lucky and exhibiting some ingenuity and, and this uh, cowboy attitude, which they really like to push in this first one. And I guess it didn't carry through in some of the later sequels. But uh, in this one, I, I felt like, you know, Bruce, Bruce Willis was very well cast. Like prior to this, he was known as Moonlighting, right? Like this was mm -hmm. his first major movie. As far as I know, he might have done some other thing before this. But yeah, from what I know, it was, it was Moonlighting straight to this. And I don't know how exactly how he went from that. I made that leap, but they just like his character. And yeah, I would say it was excellent casting. Um, he's since gone on to do a whole bunch of crap and a whole bunch of phoning it in. 
Bruce Willis is probably one of the most guilty actors when you're talking about people that don't give a shit about some of the movies they do because they just they'll do anything apparently. But he's also been in a lot of great stuff. I mean, Pulp Fiction is one of my favorite movies of all time, if not the most favorite of all time, and he's he's in that. So and he's not a bad actor either. I mean, clearly in this movie, you see him really showing a lot of personality. And if there's one thing the audience needs in order to like a person, it's generally personality. Personality goes a long way. It's true. And uh, I'm sure you liked him in Sin City, right? I did. I loved him as uh, McCallahan Callahan in, um, in Sin City. Yeah, that's great. He's done a lot of good stuff, but then he's also done a lot of mediocre crap that's completely forgettable. But, yeah. you know. I mean, Sixth Sense was pretty good. And uh, what was the one where he was like a taxi cab driver in a flying taxi cab? Mm. Fifth Element? Yeah, Fifth Element. Yep, that's the one. Yeah, that's kind of a classic sci-fi that is well-remembered. I haven't watched it in a long time, but any movie with Gary Oldman in it, has got to have something decent about it because he's such a strong actor. All right, Shaheen, you got the mic, my man. This was the first time I actually watched uh, Die Hard. Just watched it last night. Oh, shit. Broke his cherry on this one. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was really good. I've always wanted to watch it, just uh, never had the time or a reason to sit down and watch it. What do you think? Oh, I thought it was really good. Uh, it's, it's kind of disappointing how the sequels are uh, so shit. Yeah, they really seem to be big cash grabs, or they're just like didn't really understand what made the first movie really good, and that seems to be a lot of the case with a lot of like sequel writers. I mean, what really made this movie a movie for me, an enjoyable experience, was the character of McLean and his attitude about the the bad guys and you know his relationship with the cop and how they instantly bonded and that sort of thing, and how there was banter back and forth between the bad guys and McLean, and they could actually talk on that radio. That was a huge storytelling device. It really let us in, the audience, into how these characters felt about each other and who these characters were. And a lot of movies, you, don't, you just don't get that, at least in the, especially in the succeeding uh, Die Hard movies. There's some where McLean will be talking on the telephone to, I forget the name of the actor, and like, I think it's the third one. So there's a little bit of banter back and forth, but maybe, maybe it's just the personality aspects that really got to me with this one. But anyway. I mean, I think Alan Rickman was really good in this. I mean, he was just like this cool, collected operator, you know, just very... Very engineering precise, you know? Yeah, and he wasn't just a raving psychopath. I mean, he was, you know, he's having calm conversations with people, and he has a perspective that even if you disagree with his methods, and of course we would, it's important to at least have him be a believable character, you know, so that we can go, well, yeah, I could see some psychopath would just not care about whatever, and he would want to rob this place. And he's really smart, and he's anticipating the FBI, and he's got all these weapons and, you know, things that are ready to go to counter anything that he's going to come across. You can appreciate someone who's put a lot of effort and planning into a thing. Just as, you know, it makes, a, it makes, for, a great, it makes for a great villain. And he's not just some cartoon cardboard cutout. He's uh, like a human type person. It's good. Yeah, I really like how um, he, he just planned for everything and how he planned, like how he anticipated what the cops and the FBI would do was part of his plan. And he just planned for that. Now, Shaheen, being in the engineering school, do you find how people can fall into the trap of thinking of politics as engineering or social problems as engineering? Because that seems um, to be a thing that people tend to do is they think that they can use engineering concepts and physics concepts and apply it to social sciences and, and correcting problems with, you know, humans. And it's, it's like the progressive uh, fatal conceit. Yeah. Uh, there's something that, um, that I've noticed. Most engineers are, are not social justice warriors at all. And most of them have a more, um, far more rational mindset. I'm not really sure how they think about economics and politics. They, they probably do think, I mean, it's just that engineers, that everything can be turned into a system and then uh, planned and uh, created. They don't understand the whole uh, concept of, uh, of a spontaneous order. So, yeah, I'm not really sure about that. Yeah, my conversations with them, they have tended to fall into the trap of central planning and thinking that having a plan is vitally important to structuring society. And they have a it, hard time thinking outside of that or not holding on to that security blanket. Yeah. Something I always say to other people to get them off the uh, mindset of planning an economy or society to tell them, go ahead and plan a football game. And the, then they stop to think because they realize that no, you, can't, you can't plan a football game or you can't plan a... A, um, an economy either. And by football game, do you mean international football or American football? Um, anything, anything, just just a sports game. I don't really watch any, any sport anyway. Yeah, Robert watches the yeah, sports. There's a, there's a famous Mike Tyson quote. I believe it's Mike Tyson. It could be somebody else, but it's another kind of famous type of boxer person who's like, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> that's, 
You know, they think they can plan out a boxing match or, like you said, a game. Like, you think you can plan it out, but you can't. And once you get hit, all bets are off, and now you're just making it up as you go along. But even in football, American football, they do run plays, and they do practice these plays, and they do design them up and trod them up. But even with that level of planning, there's another side that's planning their best to thwart you. That, that almost brings it down to a zero-sum game or some kind of a, a competition of winner versus loser, which capitalism is not really that. I mean, it's, it's more of a confluence of needs and wants being met. So it's not really adversarial, so to speak. I mean, there is competition, but it's, it's a different kind of nature of it. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, I think I was going to just point out that, yeah, there's a, um, back to the sports thing, there was a famous, I want to say, I can't think of it, there's no way I'm going to remember this guy's name, but it's a, there was a coach, and maybe many coaches have done this over the years, I don't know, but I know for sure at least one coach has done this, where it's American football, and they'll plan out, say, like the first 20 plays before the game, and they'll stick to that regardless, no matter what's happening. And to me, that sounds like kind of crazy. No matter what your opponent is doing, you're just going to stick to these pre pan plays. And I don't know if those were, he had a lot of success with that and stuck with it, or if he has since changed his mind or now he's retired, I don't know. But it strikes me as a little bit insane that you would want to stick to a plan regardless of what your opponent is doing. That, you got new information now. You can use that to make a better plan. It's the whole point of you know adapting. Yeah, it sounds like the police and FBI's approach to the situation in Die Hard. Yeah. Right. We're, this we're, we're bringing this. Says, regardless. Yeah. This is what the playbook says. This is what we're doing. And Hans Gruber had the same playbook. He knew what they were going to do, and he planned accordingly. Right. So when you're dealing with someone like that, you got to change up the playbook, or else you're going to get own oh, son. I also liked how, how the Germans kind of came into the building, how they were just so nonchalant and playing, you know, pretending like they cared about the sports, and, you know, they're just acting like totally normal people. Like they're just there for Christmas or whatever, and it just put instantly disarmed their their victims, right? You're just like hanging out, talking, talking about whatever, some ridiculous thing that means nothing, and then you shoot a guy in the head like it's nothing. <laughs> they just had a sense of style, you know? You got to kind of kind of give them some props. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like the Notre Dame-USC game was on, and he was when uh, Family Matters came to investigate the building, he was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I got $50 on this game. And these assholes are losing or something like that. And Reginald Val Johnson, I think that's his name, he, he like started looking around. And he's like, man, fuck this shit. I'm getting out of here. Mm. Yeah, yeah. He's like, hey, can I look around? And the guy's like, yeah, who cares? Whatever. And that's exactly the attitude you want to have to instantly disarm the other guy and make think that nothing's going on. Yeah, so let's set the scene a little bit. Like, what is the overall plan as you see it, Robert? The overall plan of... Alan of, Rickman? Yeah, of, of Hans Gruber and his crew. Because it is pretty elaborate, and he does plan for many contingencies and has a an escape plan that, that would mean that no one's going to search for them, which I think is pretty brilliant. Yeah, so he he's planned all this out as a big robbery, but he's also taking hostages. And generally, I don't know if this was you know, right after some other, probably some airline hostages taking or whatever, but you know, international terrorism is kind of well known at this point. It's well after the Iran hostage crisis and all that sort of thing. And so he's got this plan where they're going to, he knows that all these, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in bearer bonds are in this vault. And he takes over this Christmas party and he grabs the one guy that knows the computer passwords and that sort of thing in order to get the end of the vault. But when that goes south and he kills the guy, which is nice because, you know, that's an unforeseen thing. Like he hoped that he would be able to get it out of that guy. But if he didn't, he still had a plan. And then, you know, it's only a matter of time before the cops get involved. And he anticipated that, like we said. And then the FBI comes in and they're having problems and they can't get in. But then the, he knows that the FBI protocol is to shut the power. And then voila, there's this Christmas miracle. And then all of a sudden they can get in because of the time lock opens when the power goes out or something like that. And... Yeah, then with the roof thing, they know that they're going to you know, probably try and enter the building at some point, and they're going to blow up, essentially blow up the building, or at least part of it, and make it seem as if you know, they're dead, so that people don't come looking after them. Because really, yeah, if you go ahead and steal hundreds of millions of dollars, like he says, they're going to come looking for you, but they won't if they think you're dead. And it's, it's just really brilliant, and it's really just kind of like bad luck, I guess you could say, or good luck, whatever. Um, that um, McLean just happened to be there and throw off all their plans. Is that the plan? Yeah, yeah, I think that's really good. Um, now, Shaheen, I know that you're a bit of a younger guy, so did some of the Japanese being almost overpowering economic force, it, as described in the movie, like, oh, they're buying up everything in the United States, so oh, they're 
uh, out competing the Americans, etc. Like that was a big deal in the 80s. Like people were were like I don't know they felt like we were in a competition with the Japanese and that the Japanese were taking over and becoming this economic powerhouse and threatening American whatever. Well, that was when their products started really getting good, right? Because for a long time after World War II, their first their products were kind of crap. I remember my dad telling me that you know when he was a young man that if it said Jap- made in Japan on it, I mean it was garbage. But in the 80s, with the rise of like Sony and then Mitsubishi and Toyota and Honda and all those kind of things. And they really, the quality really jumped up, made a big leap. Then, yeah, they just started dominating the markets. Isn't there a scene in Back to the Future about this? When uh, Marty goes back in 1955 and a part says, made in Japan, then the 1955 doc says, uh, oh, that's why it's shit, because it's made in Japan. Could be. That could be. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen Back to the Future in a while, but that'll definitely stand out to me the next time I watch it. But yeah, I've, I've heard the same thing, Robert, that, that essentially Made in Japan was the equivalent of Made in China like, you know, 10, 15 years ago. But of course, now things in uh, Made in China are getting really good, you know. There's a lot of capital investment and, and efficiencies made there that, uh, that, that make cheaper goods and higher quality goods for people to enjoy. And I think Absolutely. that was essentially what happened in Japan in, in that there was a lot of capital investment. I mean, it was a culture of saving. And so there was, there was a lot of uh, investment in elongating the capital structure that made those investments um, pay off in being extra competitive uh, in the world marketplace. And so the cars got better, the electronics got better. Uh, there's even a line in the movie where, uh, I forget his name, but it's, it's the Japanese character who's, who's the, the boss there. He says, uh, Pearl Harbor didn't work out, so we got you with tape decks. And I thought that that was just kind of a, a, a fun little nod because it really was a fear back when this movie was made that uh, the Japanese were taking over. And, and you know, since, since then, they went into a 20-year uh, zero-growth <laughs> tailspin, which is kind of unfortunate. But I think that's their, um, their Abe, you know, continue to inflate their currency, the yen uh, policy, which is, is not really working out. Yeah, and they've got a huge debt problem, as I recall, similar to what we got. You know, right. In the States. And then a, a very um, top-heavy demographic, like uh, a very aging population with not a lot of uh, younger generations, so it doesn't support any... You have uh, all the herbivore men there now. None of them are getting married anymore. Right, yeah. So any, any structure, social program that's predicated on more young people paying in for fewer older people to receive, sort of like the Social Security type scenario in the United States, it doesn't play as well there because there's not as many people in the younger generations. Right, so how could they possibly fund it? Yeah, so anyway, that was my little diversion into uh, the Japanese end of things. Um, I did notice, and this is kind of funny, in the very opening scene where Bruce Willis is on the airplane and he talks to that guy about crunching his toes into the carpet, uh, that guy sees his, his service pistol in his shoulder holster on the airplane. And he goes, oh, it's okay, I'm a cop. Yeah, as long as the state has uh, said that it's okay for this guy to be carrying this weapon, then now you're safe. Otherwise, you're, you never know. Millions and millions and millions of millions of gun hunters. And if everybody was a crazy gun-wielding maniac, I mean, there'd be a whole lot more deaths. Yeah, there's a lot of the, the mindset that, oh, if someone has a gun, oh, how can, they, how, how can they be carrying a gun? That's so scary. Whereas it's really not that big of a deal. Yeah. I mean, you might be surrounded by weapons all the time, and you don't get upset or you know freak out when you see some guy in a blue costume wear, have a gun. I mean, I do, mm. but most people don't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Now, in a previous episode, or perhaps it was in a pre-show portion, you had indicated that there was a ban on knives as well, something like that? Uh, I think I, there's, I'm not allowed to carry them. I'm allowed to have them at home. I'm, I'm allowed to buy them. Because there's a, I, I just have to be 18, which I'm 19. There's a, there's a shop that... Uh, uh, pretty nearby that sells heaps of different uh, combat knives and throwing knives and like cap guns. Uh, that's all we have to deal with. The closest thing we get to a real gun is a metallic looking cap gun. It's really pathetic. Not even airsoft. That's going to scare somebody away. Oh, uh, yeah. Buy the arms tip again. But yeah, we're allowed to buy knives, but we're not allowed to carry them, which defeats the purpose of just having a weapon at all for self defense. Right, yeah. so if you're out and about. But, I mean, there, there are gangs and criminals, right, and they have weapons. Yeah, well, we have heaps of bikers here in, um, in South Australia, heaps of bikey gangs. And these are like Harleys, or are they like... Oh, yeah, yeah, Harleys. Okay, interesting. I've heard a lot of them have, uh, have guns they get through the black market, so they are, they're always going to have their guns. It's just the good law-abiding citizens that get disarmed. 
that's how it works. And yet there are people who claim that gun regulation somehow is going to protect people. It doesn't make a single bit of sense to me. But, I mean, yeah, uh, there are, you know, some deaths where a kid will dig it through some drawer and find a loaded gun and kill somebody or hurt themselves that's or something like that. That's just bad parenting. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> It's like people were whining about um, YouTube now, how it's like a haven. They call it like a haven for pedos and stuff like that. Right. Or like it's really a cesspool for kids. Like if, you know, you got kids just going on YouTube and watching stuff. And it's like, well, where are the parents at when they're just having their kids just watch whatever on YouTube? Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, YouTube probably do a better job keeping that kind of stuff off their site. But I'm sorry, man, you can't just offload your parenting duties to a website. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah, well, YouTube just announced today that they're going to have 10,000 workers going through content to weed out this uh, targeted, like, violent content that's keyworded and uses children's characters. Say what? Yeah, they're, they're, they're going to... Mean? Oh, so that's what they're going after, uh, is that there are a series of videos out there that are getting millions and millions of views because kids are watching these things because it's exactly that. Parents will sit their kids down in front of their iPad or their uh, smart TV watching Peppa Pig or Spider-Man or whatever on YouTube, and then it'll play the next video, the next video, the next video, just continuously. And these videos are in that lineup. They have the same keywords, uh, the same characters, oh. the same descriptions. It's a ser- like one of, one of the series is something called Spider-Man and Elsa, something a friend of mine told me. Okay, what's that about? Uh, it's like the whole thing where they have kids in there and they, they might tie them up or something. I'm not sure. I haven't really looked into it. Yeah, well, I know mm-hmm. one of them is Peppa Pig going to the dentist, and she's being tortured. And then there's another one, and I actually watched about three and a half to four minutes of it. But it was something with um, really cheesy computer animation with, like, Batman and Spider-Man and Mickey Mouse just doing the weirdest violent shit you could imagine. Like, yeah. murdering each other, stabbing each other, hitting each other with bricks, all this just crazy, ridiculous stuff. And this would auto-populate as the next video for a now, lot of kids' videos. Do you think that this is intentional by these creators, or is this YouTube putting things where they don't belong to with each other? I believe it's intentional. I think that these people make these because they know that they're going to get a lot of views if they... Well, it's true. Kids, use, kids, kids watch a ton of YouTube. I mean, I've seen kids stuff with, like, yeah, millions and millions of views. It's true. Right. Right. And so if you're looking for the ad ad rev, then right. you make this, uh, you know, kids content. If you're making legit, if you're making kids content, but instead of kids content, you're making them like murder each other. What's the, what's your long-term goal? What's your actual goal there? Are you trying to traumatize people? Or are you trying to, I mean, what? Well, that's the thing I don't understand because if they're making good ad rev money, then why not just make kids content that's kid friendly? It's not like it's hard to write. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Right. I mean, there, Sorry, there's kid. stuff out there that it's just somebody playing with dolls and making up a story as they go along, and that has like 5 yep. million views. Yep. So I, I tend to think that this stuff is made by people who sort of get a charge out of doing something naughty, putting something out there that okay. they shouldn't. Okay. And kind of maybe college kids, you know? Who um, like they're trolling or yeah, getting yeah, a lot of it. Right, because I can see like videos like this, like being a hit at a college party. Like, you know, like people have had a few drinks and they're like, oh, let's watch some some of this crazy shit I saw on YouTube. And it's like fucking Spider Man throwing Mickey Mouse down a well, you know, shit like that. And um, mm. full disclosure, I the three or four minutes I watched of this, I was uncontrollably laughing at just how insane it was and how crazy it was. And my wife was like, what are you watching? And that just made me laugh more. Um, but, I mean, you know, once you get a few minutes of it, you're like, all right, the, the rest of it's like this. There's no reason to watch any more of it. Right. But, but apparently it's a, it's a big deal. So, yeah, they, they're making a concerted, concerted effort to, um, to eliminate it. But it also gives them perfect cover to attack anything that they deem, quote, unquote, extreme or extremist content from libertarian... Uh, Movie reviewers. Well, we've already got a strike from uh, one of our episodes. Uh-huh. Well, and it very well could be. I mean, with the whole demonetization thing. Well, this this is removal. So not even just demonetization. This would be um, removing the videos and removing the user. Well, and um, the uh, ATF and the I believe it's the ATF or whoever does the federal background checks and that sort of thing for firearm sales in the United States. You know, they do a background check that includes like mental health and you know uh, pathological what problem with authority is seen as a mental disorder these days, according to the DSM-5. So I could see 
you know, if anybody's interested in disallowing or rejecting a firearm sale due to that sort of thing. I mean, I've never actually been officially diagnosed. I don't even know how you would do that, but if there ever comes a time where I have to be evaluated, I'm sure I would be slapped with that. Opposition, oppositional uh, defiance disorder or something like that? Is that what that is? I forget the exact terminology, but that's essentially what it is. Freedom fighter disorder. <laughs> Pretty much. You disagree with what the uh, violent oligarchy says. All right, let's slide this back to the movie real quick. Uh, so McLean gets to the party and meets Ellis, who's this skeezy, cokehead, uh, salesy guy who's putting the moves on McLean's wife. And I couldn't help but think that in this day and age that what he was doing and trying to get her to go to dinner with him would now be considered sexual assault. Yeah, that, that's what oh, I yeah. thought as well. <laughs> like, oh, you don't want to go to dinner tonight? Well, come on, let's go to dinner tonight. You know? And she's got two kids at home and her husband's on, her, on his way. So I don't know what this guy was thinking. I mean, maybe he was already coked out. He was doing coke like the whole movie. Uh, but he yeah. had given her like a Rolex, and this watch becomes pivotal later on uh, in the very climactic scene. I don't know if you guys caught on, caught wind of that. Yeah. No. Well, we'll save that for later on, Robert. I'll clue you in on that one. Okay, uh, one of the things I thought was really interesting, this was part of Hans Gruber's plan, was that they were going to position themselves as terrorist revolutionaries who were not stealing money, but trying to free captives in other countries who were from organizations that they had just become aware of, like they saw Asian. Yeah, the Asian Rising, whatever they saw in uh, Newsweek or Time Magazine, and they, they just yeah. threw them in to, to lend some credibility to their uh, conceal, concealment of their plan. So they were trying to pose as um, revolutionaries to sort of throw off the scent so that when they uh, did blow up the top of the building and everyone thought that they were also killed in that, that, uh, and all the money you're missing as well, destroyed. Right, yeah, so there'd be nothing, no reason to look into it any further. So that, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, and yeah, fanatics often blow themselves up, you know, if they believe in a certain cause or something like that. They're not afraid to have choose a hill to die on. So, yeah, it was uh, really smart. It was a well-written plot where the, where the characters act, acted sort of believably for the most part. I mean, there's a few quibbles where guns are pointed and not, Triggers are not pulled when they probably should have been, but whatever. But for the most part, yeah, these characters are uh, intelligent, and I can appreciate that for sure. Did yeah. you notice that the the first terrorist that dies, he looked a lot like Hans Hermann Hopper in his younger days? That's something I wrote down. It's just <laughs> a quick thing I noticed. The blonde Especially guy with the big glasses. glasses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so speaking of that guy, he said, um, you know, come on out. I won't hurt you. And then he, he gets around this, like, construction area and start shooting immediately before he sees what's beyond it. So he clearly was lying. Yeah, you can't really trust that guy to be telling the truth. Breaks in with a bunch of machine guns and they're already killing people. So yeah, you have no reason to believe him. Yeah, and then uh, back to, to, to Hans Gruber and his, uh, his cover for his, for his plot, for his plan. Uh, he was saying a lot of uh, revolutionary type things, like very commie things. He said in, in, when they first started throwing, uh, throwing guns around at the party, they were like, the legacy of greed that the Nakatomi uh, Corporation has used is powerful, but you're going to see a real power now. You're going to be a witness to another power. And then he went into talking with, with the guy about their plans in Indonesia, and the Nakatomi guy was like, no, we, we, we plan on investing in that area and, and providing jobs. We're not there to exploit. And so there were many nods to very uh, socialistic rhetoric um, mm. on display by Gruber and his, and his henchmen. Yeah, well, those often, that often yeah, those socialists are usually the the psychotic revolutionaries that don't mind using violence. I mean, you're talking about a, like a Che Guevara type who killed how many people? Dozens and dozens by his own hand. Right, yeah. And then, and then uh, back to that first guy you killed the, that looks like Hans Hermann Hoppe. He said, you won't shoot me. And Bruce Willis, Moonlighting, is like, well, why not? And he says, because you are a policeman. There are rules for policemen. Yeah, speaking of which, oh, yeah. wasn't the policeman force a guy to cut off his dog's head a few days ago? That well, I'm not aware of. There was a report. Um, I just saw it a few days ago. I think it was on the Ron Paul it was either InfoWars or, or Ron Paul thing I saw. Uh, it was about uh, how a police officer forced a man to chop off his own dog's head after they shot him. Uh, the, the dog, I mean. And then, yeah, they're, they're the rules for the policeman, right? Yeah, the cops will just blow away any family pets that they feel, quote-unquote, threatened by. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, the dog is there to protect the family home, and you got these armed invaders. 
How else is the dog going to act? Intelligently, defending his pack. Yeah. And she will just murder him. I bet you if they were like a, you know, a private force and they actually had to respond to the market, somebody would have come up with a way of dealing with, you know, barking angry dogs without murdering them by now. Just a thought. Yeah. Pro would have been cheaper as well. Shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. That'd be far more efficient. They actually had to deal with market pressures. Yeah. It'd have to be. Something I noticed about what uh, Hans Gruber was saying, how, how he, the, they were in charge. It's like, we won't hurt you if you cooperate, but you make no mistake, we are in charge. I thought, well, he is the government of that, uh, at that building. Right. He is. There's a massive amount of coercion going on. We don't want to have to kill you, but we will if you make us kill you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of private security, have any of these companies ever heard of it? I mean... Why would they not have uh, any type of private security at a company that has what, 600 million all the way back in 1980s locked up in the top floor at a, during a Christmas party during an age of international terrorism? When I just don't see why they wouldn't have a, a private security or if we're going to go real in Kapistan, a, a PMC. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I mean, um, they did have uh, building security. They had a couple of guys who they're were... They're also being forced to play for the cops. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Oh, yeah. So they're told that it's already taken care of, and they had a couple of guys on security detail, and they had a seven-layer deep uh, safe that had, you know, multiple layers of security. Yeah, I mean, it took this sophisticated operation to even get the money. So I'd say it's pretty well defended, I would say, against like except everybody except for the 1%. But, of course, it's only the 1% that's going to try. So Yeah, what did you guys think about when he pulled the fire alarm and, and got the fire department to start on their way, and then... Hans Gruber's men told him, oh, it's false alarm, you know, go back. And then uh, he ends up killing one of the guys, gets the radio, and does an emergency channel and gets, like, a 911 operator. And she's like, this channel is for emergencies only. I'll report you to the FCC if you, if you don't, <laughs> like, get off the channel. Just get over here. Yeah, like, she was totally useless. Like, what is the point of an emergency channel if anyone who uses it is going to be met with total skepticism and threatened with, like, additional violence rather than actually, you know, investigating what the problem might be. Yeah. yeah, that seemed to be more of a plot contrivance to have that, yeah, blase 911 operator type person who's just like, yeah, right, right, sure, yeah, whatever. I, I, yeah, I, I think even in shitty government services world that we live in, I think even the 911 operators of today would, would take it far more seriously. Right, and, and they would have sent, you know, at least the one cop, if not more, um, even without telling the guy to get off the phone. And I, I, I thought that that was an interesting moment in, in that this was when Carl was chasing McLean through the air ducts and the elevator shafts and all of this. And then they see the one cop pull into the driveway of the building. They're like, oh, man, stop searching for McLean because there's one police car in the driveway. Like, there's a dozen terrorists, well, 11 at this point. Why would they stop searching for McLean because there's one cop car coming to investigate something? Yeah. I mean, it's not a perfect script, but I mean, it has it has its little flaws. I would agree with that. Um, I mean, honestly, you know, if McLean had thought about it, you know, when he calls initially gets on that emergency line, he could have said like "officer down." That probably would have got the cops coming to him because that's the one thing they care about is the other cops. That's the, the the most they care about. You could tell. I mean, when a cop gets killed, they pull out all the stops to try and catch that cop killer. But when a regular person gets killed, they're like, eh, you know, we'll get around to it maybe. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and as a, a police officer himself, he should have known something like that would have been more effective. Yeah. But, but I mean, plot-wise, you can't have them showing up too early, I guess. you got to have a few other things happen. It makes it more interesting, I suppose. But, eh, I don't know. Right. And then, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but Bruce Willis did most of his own stunts, but the air or the uh, air air duct transfer from the elevator shaft was actually done by a stuntman, and he slipped and actually fell further than intended, and that's the cut that they used in the movie. So what's seen in the movie is actually a mistake in that he fell further than he had planned on and narrowly averted death. Hmm. Wow. Back in those freewheeling 80s when people would die on set, I guess they still do every once in a while, but yeah, they're usually so worried about safety, as they should. Something that pissed me off was that... um. Didn't any of the any of the people that are any of the guests at the Christmas party have a pistol or a gun or anything with them for self defense? Yeah, it's like they were just kind of there. It's like a blob of people that didn't do anything. Mm. Or at least I don't know, try and help out McLean somehow. And once he throws down that, that dead terrorist guy and everybody knows that there's somebody in the building resisting, try and sneak away and help out, but I mean, from the plot point of view, you want to just have this lone hero guy, I suppose. But Yeah, in mm. present day I think California is very difficult to have a concealed firearm. I don't know about the, the late 80s. I imagine it wasn't as easy as some areas. 
But also, these people are going to a Christmas party. I mean, no one would have expected something like this to happen. I mean, you're in this building with security after hours on the 30th floor. The building should be pretty much locked down. So I don't think that anyone would have expected anything like this to happen, which, of course, makes it you know all that more viable as a target, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, on Christmas, your guard is down. I don't know. Does it, am I the only one that gets like a sense of like peace and well-being around Christmas time for some reason? Because it's been like indoctrinated into me or whatever. It just it feels like the world's more calm when there's a bunch of snow on the ground and people are just kind of I don't know moving a little bit slower. Yeah, and then there's a, another Gruber line when he's actually talking to McLean on the radio for the I think the first time, and he says that you're an orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne. And he starts calling him a cowboy. And this, of course, brings the pivotal line. And I'll give this to our guest, Shaheen. What's the pivotal line? Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. That's right. He says, I, I think of myself more as a Roy Rogers type. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Which he shoehorns into the sequels, as Robert was saying. Yes, he does. Shoehorns Horribly. badly. Yeah. So I, I hear in one of them, he, he, he says it and then shoots through his own shoulder to kill the, the guy behind him. And that's pretty yeah, badass. That's in the third one. In the third one, yeah. I guess. Why does he need to say it? It's totally out of context. Didn't make any sense. What about in the, the second one when he, makes, he lights in the, the, first one, the trail of fuel? He's like, he in the first one, it makes sense because they were just talking about cowboys <laughs> and Roy Rogers and John Wayne. Why would, he, why would he say it ever again? Just out of context, just weirdly, other than he knows he's in a movie. Because he's saying it aloud to himself in, the rest of, in these other movies. Here he's like talking to a guy, and anyway, or at least it, it makes sense in context. In the rest of the movies, it only makes sense in context if you've seen the previous Die Hard movies, and he knows he's a character in movies. Yeah, you can't walk into this without seeing the first one. Like, you can't start with two or three or four or five. You have to start with number one. I hope not. I would hope not. It'll probably turn you off from watching one. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some movies that the second one is actually better, like Terminator 2. I think it's better than Terminator. Agreed. Those are a few and far between. Yeah. Uh, let's take it back to uh, what do you guys think of when the cops finally do arrive because he throws one of the bodies out onto Family Matters' car and says, welcome to the party, pal, which is a good line. Yes. And then the SWAT team shows up and they're macho assholes and Bruce Willis is like, no, 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 what are you doing? Don't do this. Don't do that. Like he has a pretty realistic view, I think, of the testosterone-fueled you know, machismo that goes into a lot of the uh, tactics used by the mis- militarized police. I thought that was kind of an interesting angle to represent in a movie like this. Well, yeah, and he's a cop, and he knows, you know, police tactics and that sort of thing. And he also knows that Gruber is p- completely prepared for them. He knows the psychology of Gruber. He knows he's seen, you know, the weapons that they have and how prepared they are for the situation. And he knows it's going to end in disaster. And in fact, it could have been a lot worse. Gruber could have, like, really tore up the police. But instead, he was just kind of fought them off a little bit, fought off that, like, armored car and could have blown it to shit, could have fired those rockets into the regular cop cars, could have just unloaded with submachine guns into those cop cars, but he didn't. Right, well, he, of course, needed the police to perform certain actions, right? Like, he needed them to cut the power, he needed them to be in a position to negotiate and bring helicopters for his plan to come to fruition. So yeah. he was really just buying time. Playing on like a fiddle. And I thought it was interesting when the assistant deputy chief of the police, who is, of course, played by uh, the guy from Ferris Bueller. I forget his name at the moment. But he was all mad at McLean, saying, oh, you just blew up a building. Your ass is going to be in so much trouble when you get out of here. <laughs> and uh, Bruce Willis's reply to him was, well, from here up here, it doesn't look like you're in charge of jack shit. Yeah, you're the guy that just got screwed by somebody on live TV or something like that, yeah. Now, the chief also said to him that uh, you let that Ellis guy die, and that was almost like pulling the trigger yourself. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, that's that's a good discussion point. Clearly not, but this is the lefty mindset sometimes. I mean, I I thought that was patently ridiculous. Come close to assuming that McLean had anything resembling the cause to that occurring. Well, the only moral actor here is um, Hans Gruber. Absolutely. And, um... You know, what was McLean meant to do, just hand over the detonators, and which might have led to more people getting killed? How would, they, how would he have known that uh, yeah, Gruber wouldn't have just killed them both right after? Yeah, and how can you assume that Gruber would be an honest actor at all? He's clearly not. He's fully established himself as a dishonest actor. So even if you give him everything he wants, he can do whatever. Yeah, this reminds me yeah, of a like, scenario like that, that our mutual friend likes to bring up, that you have to negotiate right. with a home invader and trust that he's going to follow through with, with his word. Yeah, somehow the breaking in Home Invader is all of a sudden going to turn out to be an honest person. <laughs> Against all evidence to the contrary. Something else that I notice on a lot of movies that I watch is a lot of people say, let the police do their job. Like when one guy goes in, like when you know, Batman or um, John McClane or whatever, 
they're always told to back off, let the police do their job. And they say something about if, if he's not part of the solution, he's part of the problem, or he's not part of the equation or something like that? Yeah. I mean, what, what gives police the authority to be the people who solve the problem? Right. I mean, I, only if they were some sort of a private force, right, that the company themselves specifically want only them to deal with, then I would see that. Yeah. Then it would be a property rights issue. But other than that... Yeah, but if it's like a random company that's been attacked, and you get, the uh, let's say, the police trying to help out, but then you get another guy who's trying to help out, who's actually doing the job properly, wouldn't the people just be happy to get anyone to help out? If it's not already contracted, uh, like in this case. Right. It's like your charity argument. Well, it's like the Walter Block charity argument. Just be happy they're getting help. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what would you guys think of the FBI agents um, taking over and essentially being underhanded and deceitful? Uh, I have written down how they wrote something like, oh, we might lose 20 or 25% of the hostages and I can live with that. Yeah, how nice that they can live with that. <laughs> You're so magnanimous. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Be able to live with that. yeah. They're paying the cost with other people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that you know, collectivist mentality of acceptable losses and, you know, cannon fodder and it's the whole Machiavellian and justify the means kind of a thing. It's the mindset that these people have, that certain people are expendable. Yeah, it becomes a numbers game, like uh, Kyle Ancelon was telling us on our previous episode. And then uh, there was another scene when he was about to, uh, when they were trying to shut off the power. And the guys from the power company were like, well, we, we can't shut down a whole grid. You know, it's like Christmas Eve, what, whatever. And the FBI agent is, you know, the authority I have is the United States fucking government. You better do it or you're going to lose your job. Yeah. Well, he's a violent thug. So what do you expect him to say? They like to, you know, these cops, they come in and they throw their weight around. That's, that's kind of what they do. It is a big kind of grunting match. And who has bigger thugs in their pocket, or backing them at least. This movie did have a very much um, pro-local PD, anti-federal bent to it. I very much saw that, especially when you have the treatment of the FBI guys and how they died and nobody gave a shit. And how that was like, you know, they all thought that was just, just fine. And it, it, it was also not even just local, but also like the, the beat cops, you know, because the, the assistant uh, deputy director chief guy, he was a total dick. No one liked him. And yeah, so the localist is the best. And then the second localist is the second best. And it just gets worse and worse. Yeah. As you get more and more uh, federal and centralized power kind of thing. Right. Yeah. One other thing, and now I've forgotten it, but let's let's shift it over to the to the hungry reporter, the William Atherton character. And I, he, wasn't he the guy who played the EPA dude in Ghostbusters, yep. who was well hated yeah, for are. that? Yep. So in this one, he's kind of a prick to the guy at the station manager, and he finally relents and let him lets him uh, take a remote truck, and then he finds out who McLean is and that he has family in Los Angeles, and he goes to the house where the nanny, the Mexican. Um, uh, housekeeper has the kids, and he threatens to call the INS unless he, he, uh, he's let in to interview the kid. Uh, William Atherton character is not scoring any more points in this one than he did in Ghostbusters. No, he plays a good dick. It's true. Can't think of a movie he was in where he was actually like a good guy. So no wonder he quit acting. Yeah, I remember reading when we did the Ghostbusters that the few years after that, people would run into him and, and dislike him because of his portrayal as the EPA guy in Ghostbusters. So uh, he probably got a little bit more uh, from Die Hard as well. And then uh, one other character I wanted to bring up that we haven't mentioned yet is Argyle, the limo driver. Yeah, he seems to be either the coolest limo driver ever or the non-busiest. He's just like, yeah, well, I'll just hang out here for like an hour while you go talk to your wife and stuff. It's like, oh, sweet, I guess. Yeah, he's just hanging out in the back of the limo while shit's blowing up. He doesn't even notice for like the longest time. And then uh, he ends up punching the Theo guy, right, knocking him out. And I think Theo is the only one who... Um, survived from the terrorist group. I mean, other than the, you know, the undead scene from, from Carl, that was the guy's name, right? The, the blonde haired German dude who stumbles out and with his machine gun and then Reginald Val Johnson shoots him the first time firing his weapon since he accidentally killed a kid who had a ray gun. Yeah. Look at Daniel watching movies, paying attention. I know, trying to pay attention and all the stuff, all the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a nice little arc for the cop who, you know, hadn't fired his gun in forever because he was traumatized because he had murdered a child. And he kind of got some redemption at the end there by saving um, a bunch of people by killing the terrorist before he could shoot anybody. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I could argue that, you know, if you're some... I've heard, I heard a term recently, or I saw it on the Tom Woods group, that they're called, like, street pirates. Cuff. I think that's a good <laughs> term for them. Uh, you go into the really street piracy good. game, it's going to put you into conflict with, um, you know, a whole bunch of shitty laws that you are tasked to enforce. And these shitty laws lead to these situations where otherwise you would not be, of course. 
but there are situations where you're going to end up doing horrific things to people, innocent people, and I don't know how you live yourself. I guess you convince yourself that you need the money and you're overall doing good, but uh, sure, yeah, I don't know. Uh, just quickly backtracking to the um, to what the police chose to do, uh, what the FBI chose to do, like the um, just to uh, try to get in and I like, get the um, my car to come in as well, despite knowing that uh, and being told that these people are very well prepared and everything. It's kind of like the police is like, yeah, we'll just do whatever we want. I mean, whereas if it was private security, they would have taken a, a much more caution because if they if they fuck up, then no more business. Whereas the police can just fuck up again and again and again and uh, nothing would happen. Yeah, that's a really good point. A lot of cops have blasé attitudes about it because who cares? Like a lot, a lot yeah. of government workers where it's like, well, why would this matter to have to actually do a good job? Yeah, they're totally shielded from the price mechanism. Like they don't suffer any losses. There's some technical issues that they might have to deal with, but they're really few and far between. I mean, even the, the Reginald Val Johnson character, he shot a kid, and yet he was still on the force. Yeah. And of course, he's a sympathetic character, but still, uh, in, in a private environment, I don't think that he would have still had a job had he made the mistake like that. Well, and he wouldn't have been in that situation to begin with, probably. Or he would have known that kid, or, I mean, who knows, but massive differences between... I mean, not to say that private security still can't kill kids. It's still possible. But they would suffer market repercussions for doing that, whereas the cops don't. Right. And I'll post an article down below that Rothbard had written about privatizing the police and abolishing the public provision of police services. It's a really good in-depth analysis of uh, policing and how it might function in a private society. It's, it's really well done. So that'll be on our show notes page at actualenergy.com slash 54. Nice. What the FBI does, the whole shutting the power off, was actually what they used to their plan is what the um, the, the, the terrorist, the Hans Gruber, uh, his men, they used to, to get into the vault, to shut down the electromagnet. And then the whole helicopter thing, they were planning to blow the, the whole thing up anyway. So pretty much every intervention done by the government or the police or whatever had negative, unseen, un unpredictable repercussions that actually helped out the bad guys. Well, that's, yeah, that's another thing when you're this monolithic kind of entity and you have this playbook that you play by. Well, it's only a matter of time before, you know, people hip to the game learn about your playbook. Whereas maybe if you're dealing with, you know, a bunch of different smaller organizations, you wouldn't necessarily know what they're necessarily going to do to counteract you. Um, there may be best practices that are developed, but it sure seemed like Gruber was able to play the cops, but, you know, in the FBI as fools because they were so by the book predictable. Yeah, he definitely knew what he was doing. Uh, so let's get to the very uh, climactic scene where Bruce Willis confronts Gruber and uh, one of his men and they have his wife hostage and, and he's down to just two bullets remaining and uh, he's got his uh, a machine gun on it and they have him uh, drop that and Gruber does the you know villain talking to his uh, potential victim for too long which gives Bruce Willis a chance to pull the taped uh, pistol from his back and fire and shoot at Gruber and then shoot the other guy in the head. And then Gruber hangs on to the wife hanging out the window, and he's about to shoot at Bruce Willis, but then that watch that Ellis had given the wife is what Gruber's holding on to, and Bruce Willis releases the watch, so Gruber falls to his death out the window. And uh, interesting note, that was an actual shot of Alan Rickman being dropped into a um, like one of those big inflatable devices that catches people falling from stuff. There's some term for that. He really fell? Yeah, he really fell. And they told him they would be after a certain mark, and they did it like one or two seconds before that to get actual fear in his eyes. So it happened before he was expecting it, which I think is pretty awesome. No, that is pretty yeah. awesome. awesome. I mean, I might have been upset with them afterwards if I were him, but he probably appreciated the authenticity. Yeah, that's almost as good as the, oh, I guess it's on par with the guy jumping in the air vent and then <laughs> slipping. Yeah, and then using that cut, yeah, for sure. And I guess they, they actually shot in the in the real building, the Fox Plaza, which was under construction at the time, and it presented all sorts of challenges. They actually drove the, the SWAT team vehicle and, and really ran over the guardrail and the handrail, and they actually had practical explosives happening, and, and the helicopter maneuvers were real, and the, the guys in the behind-the-scenes stuff were saying it was really difficult to uh, pull this off in a real environment, but... You know, this is a little bit before believable CGI was really a thing. So they had to, had to do a lot of practical stuff. Yeah, that's why another reason why it still holds up. Because if it had been a bunch of crappy CGI 
we'd just be laughing at it these days. But <laughs> what, still what's this feel. really old movie? Uh, I'm sorry, if you, you can finish, I'll, I'll speak after. Oh, no, go ahead. I was done. Uh, there's this really crappy old movie called The The Claw. I don't know if you've heard of it. The Claw. I only, I only know of it in reference to Jim Carrey saying the it's like a 19, It's like a 1950s movie. I've, I've had that recent story. I've been uh, watching a lot of really old 1930s, uh, 1940s movies like Dracula and uh, Frankenstein, Wolfman, you know, etc. And uh, The Claw is just pretty much a movie where the, it's like there's an, there's an alien invasion of this big monster called The Claw. And The Claw is just a giant doll, like a, like a giant toy. And it just looks so stupid to be a monster. So bad that everyone in the movies at that time just cracked up laughing at it. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, even at the time. It's bad when even at the time it, it doesn't work. Yeah. A lot of those 50s movies, yeah, the, the, the big guys in the big rubber suit just looks terrifically bad. I, I have a hard time even thinking the people at the time thought that they were even remotely scary. But maybe they did do some good atmospheric type stuff back in the day. I just had one final thing is that the... The local police, the local authority figures there, the, the higher-ups and the FBI, all, and none of them saved anyone, aside from um, Family Matters at the end, is pretty much McLean, who was, the, who was a cop, but not even, didn't even have jurisdiction in that area. He was the only one that actually saved everyone. Yeah, I think that's true. Like, even the, the freaking FBI guys in the helicopter, they were just actually just shooting at McLean. They didn't actually save anyone yeah. from anything. I mean, McLean was also the only one who really knew what was going on. He was the only one really involved in the situation from a perspective of, of being able to see anything. I mean, everyone else was just so uh, outside of it and following some playbook. that, And, and they right. didn't really but care to cater to uh, what new information became available. Like, they tended to ignore it. Yeah, and I thought that was maybe a little bit unrealistic. I mean, if I was a commander on the scene, even if I'm some don't care cop, I think I would use somebody on the inside and as an asset to be used instead of immediately like discounting them they thought he was like one of the maybe the terrorists or just some other random dude but they didn't like, give him props at all like hey maybe we could use this guy to do something and to give us information and we can work as a team here as opposed to having bruce willis all by himself doing this but i mean as a movie as like an individual actor hero guy it works probably maybe a little bit better but even if even if he had just, like, the, you know, the two groups had worked together to solve it, uh, it still would have been, I think, it could have been very much a, a, a positive, you know, like, hero tilt, tilt type movie. It would have been a little bit, like, individual versus everyone, you know, me against the world kind of a thing. But you're right. I think that they could have been a little bit more adaptive to having someone on the inside and using it to their advantage. Because uh, Hans Gruber, he actually was caught by McLean, and he played himself off as a hostage. And I thought that was pretty fun. <laughs> And apparently that was a scene that they wrote while shooting because oh. Alan Rickman was actually able to pull off an American accent convincingly enough to where they, they shot that scene. Uh, so that was not initially planned. So that was another cool little tidbit I saw in the behind-the-scenes stuff. Yeah, that is interesting. All right, so no one's mentioned this yet. I'll do one last glaring plot hole, and then we'll get into our ratings and reviews. All Did right. you guys notice when the terrorist team enters the building via their truck, the big box truck, and the box truck opens up and they all walk out and there's a dozen guys. You can see into the truck, right? Nothing in there. Just 12 guys walking out. At the end of the movie, Theo ambulance. gets an ambulance out of the truck. Magic ambulance. Huh? No, I did, not, I did not notice that. I feel embarrassed for not noticing that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, the reason for that actually was because they didn't know how they were going to end the movie yet. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have Hans Gruber dying? What? Well, they didn't know what, what the escape plan was, was going to have been had they been successful. And so the, the ambulance vehicle, it makes sense. You know, if there is an explosion up top and they assume everyone's dead, there's going to be ambulances and police and fire trucks and everything. So a bunch of confusion. So they're going to be able to slip oh, away. So that's the Ocean's Eleven plot line. Right. Okay. But apparently they, they came up with that mid-backstroke and not early yeah, on. Well, how about that? That's always fun to know. You, uh, how, quick, how far out they plan these movies. They just kind of start. Well, we got most of the plot. Let's just start. <laughs> we'll figure it out as we go. <laughs> you know, these things are, are ever evolving. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, I mean, most of it works. Most of it works pretty well. Um, and I'll just start my summary and review right now. Uh, this is a movie I hadn't seen, like I said, in probably 15 years. And seeing it with these fresh eyes, these ANCAP eyes, it really, really stands tall for me now. Like, this is probably, at this point, one of my favorite movies, having just watched it Whoa. again. Yeah, like it shoots wow. way up the charts. It is tense and believable in, in many respects. Um, 
everything is there for a reason. Each scene is, it has a purpose, like he acquires the radio. He acquires a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. Uh, you know, all of these things happen for a reason, and it's very taut. You know, there's always a tension, and it, it is confined to a very um, small space. I mean, the building's large, but movie-wise, you know, it's all in one building. And it's cat and mouse, and he's ducking and diving, and, uh, you know, Hans Gruber's like, shoot the glass, he's barefoot. Like, there's a reason for everything. So, well, just for me, it makes the movie work, because there's a reason behind every, every action that, that happens, and uh, the practical effects uh, hold up still. Bruce Willis is a very engaging and fun character in this one. Uh, he's very flippant, nonchalant. You know, he's, he really is that yippee ki And I, I just, super black and gold, man, this is, uh, this is in the top ten. If I if I have such a list, it's in there. So that's my rating and review. Beautiful beautiful movie. Uh, top, top ten. Holy smokes. Oh well, this is yeah one of the classic action uh, thriller type movies of all time. And like we said early on, it started the, the genre of this kind of a movie because it was so successful. And it, like Daniel said, it's it's, it's tense. It, it doesn't have a it doesn't have like an invincible hero character, which a lot of movies, especially back in the eighties and even more so in the Die Hard series, suffered from in that they could have some character, like, you know, jump out of an exploding building or, you know, blow up massive explosions that would totally ruin your day if you're a normal human being. I mean, you would have this ringing in your ear for the rest of the day. You know, you would just, you would not want to do anything but sit and just try not to die from the pressure of the explosion. But it happens all the time in movies and people just walk it off. Like it didn't happen. But this movie, you know, it's a very vulnerable hero. He's skilled. He's got, you know, abilities. But he doesn't have anything to start out with. He's got one, you know, service pistol. And he's barefoot because he's scrunching his toes in the car. Because the guy told him that. And like Daniel said, every, you know, there isn't like a wasted scene. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the the hero vulnerability really stands out in this movie. And it, it, to the movie's benefit, you you feel for him. When he has to run across that broken glass, you're like, oh, no. And he, you see him like, you know, picking glass out of his feet and it's just like horrible. And, um, you know, he's got cuts and scapes and bruises and he's bleeding. And at the end of the movie, he's just a mess. And yeah, there are a few kind of weirdo quibbles that I could get into on a scene by scene basis, but I'm not going to do that here. Um, cause I can't exactly remember them all overall. Yeah. It's, it's really good. It's one of my top action adventure movies of all time. I wouldn't say it's uh, like a top 10 all time, but you know, that's great that it's, it's hit that hard for Daniel. I'm, I'm really happy to know that this is a good movie for him. Uh, and it is still still good for me. Uh, it still holds up. A lot of fun. Um, and it really comes down to, yeah, the character of John McClane and his attitude and just, you know, the quips and the one-liners, which were in context and made sense and were funny. Black and gold. Gene? Well, this was the first time I ever watched uh, this movie. I was planning on watching it for a while. Finally got around to it. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I'm a big fan of the whole uh, stuck in the stuck in a building movie where like if you, I don't know if you guys have seen the new Dredge uh, Dread movie the Judge Dread one yeah with the one with the the time slowing drug yeah yeah that one yeah that was kind of the same it's like the whole movie is about one big building there that they have to survive through I was like uh that's a genre that I really like it's like a, it's a subgenre but yeah knowing as how this is the one that spawned that. Um, of course, it's going to be a really good one. And um, uh, I suppose I, I just really like the whole one man against the world thing, the whole individualistic uh, aspect of it. How it's just uh, John McClane going against all the terrorists and the cops are useless and they can't help him at all. So, yeah, black and gold. Yeah, baby. Yeah, that's another thing that we, yeah, I should have mentioned, or really focused on. Yeah, I'm glad you did. That's the, uh, the individualistic aspect. Like a lot of these movies, you know, when there's a, a kind of vigilante hero type character, it's really the vigilante versus the, the collective mindset where the individual has this specific knowledge and he's in a, maybe in a better position and he knows better. But then there's this collective, which is the cops in this case, and the, the FBI, who are like, no, 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 do it this way or don't do it at all or whatever. And the, the individual is like, no, I know. I'm going to believe in myself and I'm going to do it. That's uh, yeah, really important. Yeah, Willis had that tacit on-the-ground knowledge and the collective you know, government workers had, well, we're the experts, right? So we're not going to believe you because you're just some dumb individual. And you're yeah, right. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good point. Yeah, well, fairly decent analysis, I hope, that uh, our audience enjoyed this episode of the Actual Energy Podcast with our returning guest, Shaheen. And Shaheen, um, you were on with us for Dark Knight. Uh, we did Dark Knight Rises. Uh, that was episode 42. And Dark Knight was episodes 28 and 29. That was a two-parter. 
because it was just so long and so much good stuff packed into that one. So people can check out those previous appearances of yours. So we'll list that down below on the uh, show notes page. Um, also, I wanted to mention that there is a new Christmas-themed Die Hard illustrated book that just came out last month. And uh, I've ordered it. It hasn't yet arrived, but I'll include a link to that on the show notes page as well. But it's an illustrated children's story, very violent children's story, uh, that retells the movie uh, with comic book style illustrations and um, full on blood and guts and gore. But uh, it has numerous, numerous five star reviews, and uh, you basically relive the movie in a illustrated format. And Robert, I think that this is something that you would be interested in checking out. It looks pretty awesome. Sweet, I'll take your word for it. I have not heard of this, but it sounds pretty awesome. All right. Well, Shaheen, thanks for, for joining us again. Uh, we, we love having you on. And uh, why don't you mention some of the ways that people can get in contact with you or follow what you do on your Twitter and all of that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm just on Twitter. Uh, I'm not going to be too active in the next month because I'm not going to have a uh, stable internet access when I'm traveling on, on holiday. But I will be back uh, around about early January. And Twitter is the only political platform I really go on. And I just write for Actual Anarchy, and you guys know where to find me there. All right, sounds good. We'll have uh, a link to your previous appearances and um, all of your articles on the show notes page for this episode. This can be found at actualanarchy.com slash 54, the 54th episode of the Actual Anarchy podcast, where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian and narco capitalist perspective. And if you like what we do here, do uh, consider giving us a rating or review. Subscribe to us on YouTube or iTunes. Also, you can support us via various means on our tip jar page at actualanarchy.com tip jar. You can support us on Patreon and get super special bonuses like behind-the-scenes content, pre-show, post-show, Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which we might head into right after we close out the show with a special guest appearance by Patrick McFarland from the Liberty Weekly Podcast. So thank you guys for joining us for this episode. It's a Christmas-themed all month long. We're doing Christmas movies. It's the holiday season. It's the time of the year where your guards let down and uh, you hope the terrorists don't break into your building to try to steal $640 million of bearer bonds. Well said. All right. Well, thank you guys very much, and uh, good night. Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do